And now to introduce our wonderful keynote speaker. And these are again words from our wonderful steering lead, Ashadi, who has laryngitis today. So I'm speaking on her behalf. Um, when we originally came up with the theme for this year's conference, we knew that we wanted to have our keynote speaker be someone who embodied the idea of intentional and sustainable community. For us, Mama Shu embodies all of this and more. Mama Shu has been a pillar of the Highland Park community for over 27 years. She is the founder and CEO of Avalon Village, an eco-village that came into being after she endured the loss of her son, Jacoby Ra. The village currently owns 40 plus parcels of land and five houses. Just this past month, after six years of development, her homework house of a learning and activity space for the children of the village opened. If we could give her a hand for that. <laughs> Frankly, naming accolades and accomplishments could last us this whole session but we want to take a moment to honor the loving manner in which she has cultivated her community at Avalon Village. Her well-known catchphrase, from blight to beauty, are words of manifestation. She has poured everything into ensuring that her neighbors, her village, have access to be a full and flourishing environment. When the library of the homework house was being built, Mama Shu specified that she only wanted the best of the best books for children no stains or tears or broken spines. This moment encapsulates Mama Shu's dream of building an environment in which the environment reflects the beauty of its people and fostering a community full of joy and fearless living. And so that you can get some additional context about the work, we present to you the following video. And then we will have Mama Shu come and speak. And now we present Mama Shu. Peace and love, y'all. Peace and love. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here to speak at your building power towards sustainable community. And I want to thank Ashani for introducing herself to me by coming down to the village. Uh, she came to, um, we had a village hall meeting, and that's where we met. And uh, I didn't know she had some stuff up her sleeve. Now I'm here. Uh, <laughs> that's what you will uh, part of it. But I'm very, very appreciative of being here. I was just over there just tearing up or whatever because one of the reasons is that the space doesn't look like that anymore. It's just so, just looking at it in ruins and everything at that time, it's just so beautiful just to see it. And then also, one of the... One of the builders was my dear son, Chinyelu, and he's an ancestor now. And I think you guys honored him earlier uh, today. His name meant Invincible, but he is still here in uh, spirit, and I'm about to get myself together. But those are the things that are different in my life right now. More beauty, and then also I have another ambassador in the heavens helping me and being a champion for what it is that we're doing. So thank you so much. So I want to start off, y'all. First, I'm going to get me some water. This is really cool. This is a nice group, too. The food was good. That cabbage was on point. <laughs> yes, it was. Thank you. So a few words that we're going to talk about first, and I want y'all to keep these words in mind. Uh, and, and maybe these phrases, mutual aid, sovereignty, sustainability, uh, yeah, and community uh, sustainability. Those are some of the things that I want you to keep in mind as we talk. So I wanna first start off by letting you know that I am the CEO and founder of Avalon Village. It's in Highland Park, Michigan. Highland Park, Michigan is approximately 2.9 miles. We have about less than 10,000 folks that live in Highland Park right now, mostly renters. Avalon Street and Avalon Village is between Woodward and 2nd Avenue. 
Um, it is a block that was actually a very, very notorious block uh, full of crime and uh, just blight and just, uh, just a lot of things, abandoned homes and everything. And I recall, and these are the beginnings, I was living on Rhode Island Street in Highland Park and I, w I grew up in Highland Park also. Um, I, I, actually, I was born in Highland Park in a Detroit osteopathic hospital, which no longer exists. But I was living in Rhode Island at the time. I would drive past this house. It was on the corner. And I would just drive down the street back and forth. I'm like, wow, like this block is just too toe up. You know, I really wanted to come over there and really do something. I said, I'm going to build my ministry over here. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to buy this corner house, and I'm going to build my ministry. And so I would go to my school administrator job. One day, I believe it was on Martin Luther King's birthday, we were doing a, uh, a day of service, and it was six months after my first uh, son, Jacoby, who's an ancestor as well. And uh, it was six months after he died, and I'm rolling. And this house that I wanted, that I said I wanted to build my ministry in, it was available. I turned down the street. And how I knew that, I saw a big dumpster in the uh, driveway. And so I turned down. I looked. I was like, wow. I walked up on the porch. They had a sign stuck in the window. And I called them. Um, and I, I hurry up and got to work. I called them. So they were offering the house for about $5,500. And so I said, well, um, I have 3000 And they said they'll take it. And I didn't have 3000 you know how you like, okay, let me just go ahead and get this money up afterwards and stuff. I'm like, man. So what I did was to close. My, my girlfriend from Chicago, she sent me $1,500. I had about $462 with a, it was a state income tax check came and then my job check. Patched it all together and then I bought that property on the corner, the house that I kept looking at and that I wanted to come over there fix my ministry up on that block on Avalon Street between Woodward and Second. And so I got that house. I stayed in it, boarded up. And my goal was to basically transform blight to beauty. Um, I wanted to, uh, uh, I looked at all the blight, and on that block it was mattresses, y'all. It was, oh my God, abandoned boats. Somebody overnight threw a boat on the in one of the lots. Um, just all kinds of stuff. It was crack selling on the corner, unfortunately, when I first bought the house, and I stayed in it, boarded up, until I got to where I got enough money to do one thing at a time. And that is the way that it looked. But my thing is, is that I felt that we deserved something better. I believe that I deserve something better. And I knew that some of the streets uh, and some of the cities that were up what were going north, they were looking beautiful. They had beautiful grass. They had eclectic shops. They had schools. They had street lights. They had so much beauty. And I just felt that we deserved that too. And so when I sat on my porch, uh, I had my house, right? And then I had the lot next door that I could get, and then I just saw all the rest of the blight. But a lot of times, folks, we just sit around and we just look at just our part and we just want to do our little grass and keep our uh, uh, flowers up and our lawn up and everything, and then it's all of this other stuff around you. But what I wanted to do was is that I wanted to look at something beautiful. I wanted to look at something healthy. I wanted to have a safe environment. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to clean this uh, one block up. I'm one lot up, and then I'm just going to keep going. And then I came over there and built Jacoby Rye Park, named after my ancestor's son, Jacoby. He was hit by a car, and so it was important for me to build a park that was in the vacant lot, so it was kind of off of the street more safely, and even the playscape is in the back. So that was important to me. So that was really one of the very, very first things that I built was the park uh, out of some of the blighted lots on the block. Um, that took about eight years, y'all, to do. It took about eight years to clean the block up. I used um, I used my check to pay people. Um, some people gave me the little orange card or whatever, and you know, and they'd like get some snacks and stuff for everybody and lunch. You know, that's how we basically uh, uh, did it to pay people or to give them some type of um, compensation for helping. Also, uh, we have a rescue mission uh, there in Highland Park. It's a homeless shelter for men and for women. And also my students, I was uh, uh, administrator for 27 years. So I was like, you know what, y'all, I got this project in Highland Park. I need help. Come on, y'all need uh, you know credit hours for work experience. Come on, y'all can get them here. And so that's how I got a lot of the grunt work and all of that stuff done. So when they tore down houses, 
houses, unfortunately, they left a lot of boulders, so it was a lot of stuff to do. But I had a workforce. The workforce were the men that were in the uh, homeless shelters, and so we got them to come. I created a space for them and created actually a working schedule for them to be able to come and work for three hours. So those were some of the ways earlier on I was able to get the whole place clean and in some type of neat, uh, uh, workable uh, condition. Uh, the the uh, goal of the village is to be, it's an eco-village, it's a developing eco-village, it's a transforming eco-village. And by the city uh, at the time, and probably still right now, there's not a lot of money that flows through there. But for me, um, you know, I just don't want to sit in blight just because there's no money or there's no uh, resources. I felt that we all needed to do something as a citizen, and that's basically what I did. I'm like, I'm a citizen here. I don't want to live like that. So look, let's just get together and try to do the best that we can to make this better. And so there's a lot of things um, that are uh, lacking in the space that we live in. For instance, there's street lights, street lights that got repossessed back in 2011. But first, I'm going to go back and let you know the goal of the Eco Village is basically, because there's not a lot of money, my thought was is that, okay, what can we do to reduce costs? How can we build and it won't cost a lot. So what we do in the village, for instance, with our retail space, we use shipping containers. We have a couple of shipping containers, three of them actually, that are outfitted for use. They're off the grid. We have heating and cooling in our steam lab. That's science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. Beautiful mural on the building. And it also has heating and cooling. We have the Goddess Marketplace, which is an economic initiative for women entrepreneurs. So women are able to bring their businesses in there. They pop up tents during the summer between May and October. Uh, we're building the wine and tea shop out as we sit here right now. The guys are actually building that out. That's another business, and they have solar. The homework house is also one of the beautiful things that we built uh, in the village, too. It was on the demolition uh, list, too, y'all. And miraculously, it got off the demolition list. And I don't know to this very day how it practically got off, but I kind of uh, think or whatever spiritually how it got off the demolition list. But they wanted to tear this house down. And this is what kind of trips me out, too is that they want to tear down these houses that have these good bones and it's all of these good bricks and everything. I'm like, oh no, that won't happen because I know I had plans for that house. I wanted to build a homework house, which is a space for children to, uh, to do their homework. Children can take a shower there. It's also special needs accessible. Um, we have a computer lab. We have a studio up in there where children can make records. Um, it's a beautiful space. We also have a daycare down uh, stairs as well that's very, very beautiful. And you'll see that on a video later, how it looks. So we're building all of those things. And so my thing was, let's think of some ways that won't cost that much to do. And then also the overhead wouldn't be a lot. So for instance, even with the Goddess Marketplace, so we own uh, the lots there. We own about 45 properties in Highland on our block. Actually, we own about 98% of the block. Y'all can clap. Yeah, and that right there wasn't easy to pull off either. And it was just, it took, it was over time. It was over time, but I knew that I wanted it and I just stayed on it. Every time something came available, I bought it. $300 here for a lot, $500 here for a lot, bought the structures, and I just took my time. And time is something that I know that we have, and so it never, I never did rush with anything. I'm still not, I'm cool with however long it takes. I have eternity as, as far as I'm concerned. And so the ways that we thought about building, we're like, okay, we need solar, so let's get to the lights. We got the lights repossessed in Highland Park, unfortunately, in 2011. Um, um, Avalon Village was uh, one of the first to be able to obtain um, a solar street light. This is a street light, y'all. So all of our streets are dark right now, and they have been since over 10 years. We uh, were able to get the very first residential street light back in 2014. Uh, it happened on August the 17th. It was Jacoby's birthday, and it was a it was kind of a gift for him too. His middle name is Ra, which is the Egyptian god of the sun. So we got that street light up, and uh, 
we were the very first ones to have it because it was it's, it's security purposes, safety. The children were walking across the street. It was a big sinkhole. A lot of things didn't get fixed on time uh, in our city, unfortunately. So we had to think of things to do. So I thought solar lighting would be good and also us owning the solar lighting. Right now we have six solar street lights. Five of them is with Wi-Fi capabilities and they're all placed on the, on the land that we own. It's, and we're actually the only lit block in Highland Park right now, Avalon Street. And I'm very proud of that, too, because now we have a lot of activities for children, elders. Uh, we have the Village Hall, which you saw we were on the Ellen Show. We transformed that into Village Hall. Every city needs to have its place of business and a place to have conferences and place that we greet uh, visitors. That's our space right there. So basically, in my mind, Every single thing that um, building a city or a village, we're compacting it on that one block. So in my mind, the vision is, is that the very first block of Avalon Street, which is between Woodward and 2nd Avenue, is going to be the downtown. It's for mixed use. And it's funny how spirit lead you to that because I didn't know that, but I knew I wanted this, I want a basketball court, I want to put a tennis court, I want to do all of these things, but not even knowing really if I could really legally uh, do it. And I really don't even think that that would even make a difference either if it was legal or not because seriously, and it's a couple of people in the audience right here that know how Mama Shoe rolls, period in Highland Park and how I get stuff done. A lot of times, you know, you just gotta do some things and, you know, I done had to pay a fine or two or whatever, putting up the first street light, you know. They tax my ass like $1,000 extra, like what? <laughs> but I paid and I did it because I wanted that lot. I wanted that lot because that was part of the vision and it was part of us building something beautiful for the people, something beautiful for the children. Our children deserve to have the things in Highland Park and they deserve to have the things in the village Village, they deserve that. They deserve to have an educational facility. They deserve to have a basketball court. We have a basketball court too. It's called My Three Sons Basketball Court. Beautiful basketball court with my son's uh, faces on it. And it has all of the different countries of Africa on it. It's very beautiful. All of the neighborhood children come over, and I really got a top-notch one, too. I got one that you, you know, the, the ones that you crank down so when the kids are small, stuff, oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, we got it all. I'm talking, even the, even the, um, the, the flooring of it is like where your ankles won't hurt and everything. It's like at that, oh yeah. Because one thing about me is that my children and the people that we serve are gonna be spoiled because they need it. Actually, they need an overage of it. Having all of that blight, something needs to blight, something needs to balance that out. So for me, I'm like, you know what? We need to give it to them. Boop, they getting this. Boop, they getting that. They getting this and that. And that's how I work. That's why I want to plug in and all of those things. So. We have that. We also have uh, uh, the street lights, and also one of the important things too about uh, uh, the homework house is that we have geothermal heating and cooling. We're actually one of the only buildings in Highland Park that has a, a building ran by geothermal heating and cooling. So in the summertime, we have air condition. In the wintertime, we don't have gas bills either. So it's just really wonderful. Uh, for that, you know, and we're basically we're wanting that to spread. And right now, we're part of a Department of Energy. Um, Highland Park is part of a grant. It's called uh, it's called the Leap, and so basically, they're going to help us to. Uh, uh, I guess segue and transform into a more sustainable city. We were one of the cities that were cho was chosen is 22 cities that were chosen and we were one of them and so we're in the midst of that. It was like $500,000 grant to help basically navigate Highland Park into a more greener infrastructure so it's more cleaner. So those are some of the things that we have uh, in the village and another thing too is that we're setting up right now is the government of the village. We also have our own police department Department. It's called the Avalon Village Peace Team because that's originally what police are for. They're really to keep peace. But our police don't play either, but we keep the peace too. You know, and so they're basically there to help to keep order, to secure the children, to secure the neighbors, to secure the elders, and to make sure that we're safe whenever we're opening and we're doing stuff. And it's not a lot of stuff that goes on on the block. Because one thing about blight is that when you start fixing up, people start to respect the space. They really start to, um, uh, you know, like I was telling you about the guys from the rescue mission. 
So, and they were, they were protective too. They were like my security too. And they used to help clean up. So I would be gone somewhere. And sometimes when the, uh, I would get stuff delivered and they would put the package, you know, from UPS, those guys sat right across the street. They watched their every move. Those dudes could tell me the license plate number. He had a red hat on and he had some Adidas and he was doing this and he was sitting up there and he had a pop in his hand and he dropped off some stuff. I'm saying all details, period, because they um, began to, uh, they had ownership. That's one of the things about the village is that my idea is to invite everyone to participate, whoever wants to participate and be in alignment. And also you are part of it. The people who have given to the village thousands of dollars with the fundraisers that we've had or whatever, you get them included because it ain't my village. It's it's out it's Avalon Street. We're fixing this block up for everybody to enjoy. And so everybody has a piece of that that have um reached out in any kind of way, any kind of resource, given money, given services, pointed me in the direction where there was some funds to get, hey, you can get this and you can do this. And so we went right after it. So that's one of the main uh, things about the village too. It's a village that everybody built. And I love that about the village. Uh, I wanna talk about um, what it means to have ownership, to have land ownership. I remember somebody talked to me about, uh, this was at a conference or whatever, and I was slightly eerie when he said this, said this, but he was like, you know, this uh, land ownership is, um, is, is relatively a new thing. It was something like that. It was relatively a new thing as far as owning the land, and it should be free for everybody to just do whatever they want to. And I understood that, but guess what? When I put my street light on the land that I own, they didn't think that they taxed me, right? And usually it's people that say that or whether who already have a bunch of loot anyway. And they want to just, you know, make it seem like just because you're owning land, period, that that's a bad thing. And it's really not. It's really not. We own the land to make it beautiful. And that's the, that's the avenue and the processes that we had to go through to be able to do the wonderful things that we do in the village. Um, and also to show people that you can do that too. Our project has become very, very infectious. There are many people that are uh, uh, that are spreading the love uh, throughout, even in the neighborhood and other parts of the city. Um, they also come to talk to us about how we do that, you know, why we do that, and that is important. Just like I'm sitting here talking to you about it, like how we can do it. Some people think that things are just so mammoth, and sometimes they are. It's because they want it so instantly and so fast. And it's okay or whatever to just wait. The beauty is waiting. The beauty is the journey of it all. You don't have it all when you're trying to, I didn't have it all when I wanted to build a village. If I would have got all of that boom like that, that wouldn't, have, that wouldn't have been cool at all. I wouldn't have learned anything. I wouldn't have appreciated it. There's certain things that we have to go through. There's certain um, issues that we have to have. There's certain losses that we have to have to make us appreciate every single thing that we get every step of the way. That's what's wrong with a lot of people. Some people ain't lost enough. They don't know what's up. They don't know how to appreciate it. And I appreciate loss. Our block, terrible condition. Now here's another thing that I wanted to talk about that was kind of cool too, is that we uh, went to city council and we got the street changed. We got the street sign changed. It's now Avalon Village. We have two signs on Woodward and Second. So basically the block is called Avalon Village in Woodward Avenue. And I can't wait till y'all come down there and come see it. It's a real street sign and everything. I was so geeked. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> And that's something I've been working with over a year uh, to get, and they finally put them up actually on the 26th of uh, September, I believe, that they put it up. So that was a beautiful thing. Um, so three things that I want to talk about, um, to as it relates to building, as it re relates to developing um, some things, some of the things that we got done when you saw that video, sidewalk, the concrete, because I want everybody to be able to walk, even the folks that are in wheelchairs, they need to be able to roll safely. They need to be able to get through the village easily. That provides safety for the whole village. And also, I'm gonna tell y'all something. You know how concrete makes everything look so beautiful? All that cracked concrete on our block, that was on my wish list. I wanted to get that done 
so that the children would be safe, you know, and also we wouldn't have a bunch of liability going on too, because that's important. Because as soon as you do something, you know, I'd be like, okay, I, I broke my leg, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up. And I know they can get up too, but you know, they'll say that all of that. I wanted to avoid all of that. So I put it on my wish list. And so uh, Detroit Ready Mix Concrete, this just happened this summer. Uh, they uh, donated 100 yards of concrete. So I have, yeah, I have like 60 left to use. And so, so far what I did was I, uh, we, we, we um, and when I say I, I mean we, so far what we did was is that we used half of it. So I got half of the uh, block relayed. So all of it is beautiful. That part right there, it also adds to the beauty and order of things. Everything all cracked up and everything. When you come on that block and see that brand new concrete on there, but that's something that we did. That's through our efforts. That's what we're talking about. What is that mutual aid when folks just come to be able to raise money just to get stuff done? I sold fish sandwiches, y'all, to buy $5 fish sandwiches for real. I sold them to anybody who wanted them. Okay, the guy down there was selling weed or whatever, he would come and come get one for $5 regularly, every time. And I sold it to him too. Yep, so he helped build the village. And he waves, he do, he, I be sitting on my porch, he waves and hey, Mama Shoe, yep, you know what's going on. So he sees that. So, um, but, but like I said, it was just anybody, anybody, so they all have ownership. Those are just some of the proudest things that I do. And what I do is I create a wish list. Whatever it is that I want, I just create this whole list, and I have one for the village. I've checked off several things throughout the years, several things. That concrete thing, that came, that was just a beautiful thing. Um, grants or whatever that we've been able to get to build. So far, no government grants or anything. I've just been just grinding, uh, basically begging my family, friends, or whatever, still, hey, come help, do this. So things are up, going up to another level, and we're actually uh, being able to uh, get a little bit more funding with places that people see our work and everything, which is very exciting. Like, shoot, try out for this. I'm like, okay, bet, you know, and that's what I do. So three things I want to talk about. Am I running out of time, Ashani? All righty, because you know I could talk village talk all day long. Okay, all day long. Uh, three things I want to talk about, and these are the main things about anything that you want to do. The number one thing is to have no fear. And basically, I'm like, I ain't afraid of shit, and you can tell. <laughs> Having fear or whatever just kind of holds you back. You know, we always think that we can't do a thing and because this and that. And so much stuff is for real, y'all. It is like imaginary. It is like for real imaginary. And the thing about fear is that when my uh, 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 son Jacoby uh, got killed, me and my girlfriends, you know, every night you just have some conversation, you'll hear something that happened to a child like, oh, my God, I will die if something happened to my kids. And oh, my goodness. And I remember when that happened. It was uh, September the 23rd in 2007. And we had that conversation. It was probably some months or just in, in general just talking. And then I just, I woke up September the 24th, the next day. I, and you know, it was, and I was still living and everything. And at that point, that's when I knew I was invincible. Because that is a pain to really, really endure. Um, to, uh, it's something to live with. It's something that will never, never go away. And some things that you'll happen to you that will never, ever go away. And sometimes you still got to make it. You still got to just plow through it, you know. And I can't be no punk about it, and I'm not. It is what it is until it ain't. And we know that that ain't <laughs> never going to uh, reverse. That was one thing. The second thing is, is that plan um, A, that's the only plan that I have is plan A. I waste no time on plan B at all. Plan B takes away from the energy of plan A. What if this don't happen? What if that don't happen? Oh my God, what, let, just in case. I don't know, I don't even do no just in case. I just go straight to it. However, you may have to make some amendments and that's okay, but you need to stay on point with, with that, what spirit gives you to do. I know that this is a mission and I know that I have to stay focused no matter what it is. So I need to be staying on plan A. And so far I've been staying on plan A no matter what. The next thing is, is that, and, and all of us, we get so worried about this, that uh, I, don't worry about the money, like what it takes to do the thing. That right there, boy, it'll just keep us just sitting down, ain't doing nothing. P 
period. We just sitting there and we just get, you know, uh, uh, paralyzed because we don't want to make a move because we think that we don't have enough to do this and that. Did you hear what I said in the beginning? My friend gave me $1,500. I used my income tax check. I sold fish sandwiches. I made it happen. Hey, donate this. We're doing this. We're doing that. Bake sales and everything to make things happen. Sometimes the money is not going to appear. You need to have the passion first. You need to really show if you can really be doing this first before you get money to, to do it. Seriously. You need to, people just, and, and it stops your dreams if you think that you need to be handed this grant. People ask me, well, what, what types of grants did you get? Well, what did you do this? I'm like, nothing, nothing, period. I worked with what I had. That's one of the things in our community. You work with what you got, and which was not a lot, and we just built on that, and we just made it better. That's all you do. You work what you had. We had a raggedy block. I had a rag, some, you know, we removed the blight. We did what we had to do. We rented a dumpster. You know, use one of my, several of my checks to use to be able to clean up. So you don't need the money. And what happens is, is that when you stay in a thing and you stay consistent and you stay focused on what it is that you, you're doing, and if you want it bad enough, because you got to have that energy and put that into it, then the rest, the money is going to come. The money is just going to flow. Next thing, you're going to be connected to this. You're not going to be, you're going to be connected to that. And it's not like we have a whole bunch of money because we don't. We still have a lot of things to work on. But the thing about it is, is that that's never my focus. My focus was being a citizen. I wanted to help the city to help build a blighted block. I had fun doing it. You know, I know that we needed that. I know that our children needed to be safe. I knew that our elders needed to be safe. Those were the important things to me, period. I know I can't even take this whole village in my casket. That's not like, like for real, like this is, this is just beautiful work that we just want to do, seriously. It ain't no strings attached. It ain't this. It ain't that. You get the haters. I'm like, yeah, this. Even like Instagram is so cruel, y'all. You know that? <laughs> Instagram, she's a slumlord. I'm like, slumlord? I'm just buying, look, we're building stuff for the people and stuff. I don't rent out anything. You know, it's just so funny or whatever, just, just how people think about things. You got to let that kind of stuff even slide too. Just keep going. I'm very focused on what it is that um, I'm doing. I'm very focused on the plan of evolving uh, Highland Park and also evol evolving and help to evolve the mindset of how we can actually do things. Stuff ain't got to look all regular. You heard Steve Hartman. He said they they um, basically quoted me as the unlikely urban planner. He asked me, did I go to school for it? And I'm like, nope, I didn't pay like $50,000 that people pay to do it and stuff. I just basically followed my intuition. And I ain't even uh, downing anybody that does. But it didn't come to me like that. That's cool if you got to do it that way. But basically, my intuition just kind of tells me the moves to make. And I don't move. And those who know me, they know that I don't move unless it has to feel right. The connection is right. It has to be in alignment. I don't let anybody in the space to me that's going to upset nor control what it is that we're doing over there in the village, period. They know who the queen bee is over there. <laughs> Mwah. No, <I'm> just, <laughs> For real. But no, I'm just joking about that in a way. But <laughs> they know what's up or whatever on that block, period, okay? We have no problems over there, period. And they step lightly, especially when it comes to different ideas, because it, it deserves to be protected. You have people that want to come and they want to have these different ideas and try to just change everything. No, nope, that's not what spirit fed to me. That's not what I'm hearing. That's not, no, nope, that doesn't fit. Okay, then. And let me tell you something else. I'm willing to go without, too. You know, you be going without so long. It's all right. Look, I'm just going to build, build, little bit by little bit by little bit. It's okay. It's okay with me. Like I said, I'm not in a rush because I'm having a beautiful time doing it. I want to say thank you uh, for listening to this uh, speech, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I want to say peace and love to you. And if you have any questions, are we taking questions now? Or are we going to show the other? Uh, yes, let's show the other video first. So this is like an update, y'all. We just we just went through because we opened up the homework house. That took six whole years to build. Thank you, Ashani. Mm -hmm.
Thank you for showing that. Those are some uh, beautiful updates. So one of the updates is that, remember I told you about uh, don't worry about the money, things will come if you stay on your path. And we did get a big donor, and he was from Highland Park. He donated $50,000 so that we can just tie up some loose ends, and I wanted a, I want a battery up there so that the electric bill, we won't have an electric bill anymore. So those are the things that we're looking to be able to get with that donation and basically to support some of the programming and things like that. That's one of... Uh, uh, of the things that, um, and also the tennis court from that donator, which I'll probably meet sometime. This, I mean, he is from Highland Park. I don't know who it is, but uh, he's pretty cool though, you know, and they're very excited. And um, the uh, person who connected, I guess the, his middle man or middle woman, I should say, she said that um, he saw it on the news and she said that he had, she had never seen him like that as far as wanting to actually help and do something. She said it's like a glimmer in his eye about the village. And I thought that was so beautiful and so moving that, wow, because she said he rode through and he saw the blight, used to be apparently lived there years and years ago, and he saw the blight and everything and really wanted to do something and saw that we were cleaning up and we were trying to make the city better. My last thing before questions, I do want to say that the altars that you put up are very, very beautiful to be able to remember the ancestors because the ancestors help us to push our work. Everybody, no matter how you do it, even if you put up an altar, even if you just have a napkin from your grandmother, whatever it is in remembrance, it's still something like my grandmother would have did this this way or my uncle would have told me to do it that way. I think that that's important always to have those those type of energies and those type of uh, that force behind you always and so even in the village right now we have um, spaces that honor folks um, and we build and that's how I build things too they, they're, they're usually in memory of somebody so we have the park named after Jacoby Rye Park my two-year-old we have uh, Chinyelu's uh, he's one of our most recent ancestors he got killed a year ago he we named his a garden it's called Invincible Gardens Chinyelu means invincible and it's a beautiful flower garden and it's a gazebo that his friends helped to put up we had some volunteers because they needed that. It was healing. They hung over there, you know. He would have they have all their little three hundreds over there in the block. Now we got the STEM lab there, you know. But they would just pop, you know, have their uh, 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 three hundreds and their motorcycles or whatever, and park over there in that space. And we built um, a, a, a beautiful monument over there. The basketball court is called My Three Sons Basketball Court. Those are important. Those things are important. They help to push push us. And so I was very um, excited when you asked me about uh, you know, the ancestors that I wanted to mention. And it was very, very wonderful to actually see that space uh, up there. So does anybody have any questions? What? We have okay, a couple babe, of mic oh, runners <laughs> in the audience. Um, so there's someone on that side of the room, okay. and then I'm over here. So if you've got questions, flag me down. Just one quick question. Um, do you use particular legal structures? Because I'm working with people trying to think about community land trust, cooperatives. So when I mean, people give, do they give to you personally? Do they give to like a 501c3? And how do you get people to kind of have, um, have um, voice together and what structures you use to make that happen? So it is a 501c3. The people donate to uh, the, uh, the 501c3, which is Avalon Village. It is tax deductible. Uh, we are looking into a community land trust. I've been studying that for years, and that is exactly, uh, exactly where I want to go uh, with this. And so I'm working right now uh, to uh, get that developed. And what was your other question? So I do have a board. I have a board. Uh, Avalon Village, all of that stuff is in order. That's one thing you got to do is have your paperwork in order when you get out here because people will be like, you this and that, you doing this, for real. And we had to just be protected in all of those kind of ways. And that is our reputation too. I'm very serious about that. So we do have a board with decision making. Then also we have a village hall meeting that we have and all of their voices are heard there, the different improvements. And actually we're in the process of creating the Avalon Village um, neighborhood uh, society. So that would be for the entire name because the growth is going to go down to the other four blocks of Avalon Street. This is the downtown that we're working on now. The rest will have housing, urban garden, and also a family area, like a playground area down on each of the other blocks. In my plan and in my head. 
we do want to do our, oh, I see a hand. <laughs> we want to do our best to keep to time as best we can. Um, so we're going to have to limit the questions uh, probably after this one. Oh. If it's, if it's fast, if it's fast. Okay. Uh, I'm cons uh, I've seen like amazing revitalization efforts like, like yours, unfortunately, sometimes result in gentrification in the neighborhood. Are there ways that, that y'all are consciously trying to protect from gentrification? So I would say that would be through the uh, community land trust. That is one of the ways that we're actually going to help to prevent that. And then by being in a nonprofit, like I said, we, we have control right now. So we, you know, I, I, I look out for things like that. And so if it doesn't feel comfortable, like I said, and if it's not in alignment, and if somebody trying to just sit up there and put a Dunkin' Donuts or whatever in the village, <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like, bro, no, we not, we not finna have that, you know, like, we not finna have that or whatever, you know, I mean, I like that, but no, we're not getting ready to do that, so right now, that's what it is, we have the board and everything right now, and we're building that community land trust. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, could you please tell us about Avalon's relationship with Solidarity or, or other community reliance um, yes. projects? Yes. So that's a good question. So, um, and like you said, a lot of orga different organizations that help us to build. So Solidarity, we've been working very closely uh, with, actually for years, when I started building the village, Solidarity is, uh, when we got the streetlights repossessed back in 2011, they stepped up and actually they helped to install their very first residential solar streetlight. So we raised about 6,000 bucks. So a lot of our stuff we do do as it relates to lighting and um, energy renewal and all of that. That is what Solidarity uh, helped. And so I told Jackson, he's not the ED right now, Shamika Nichols is, but Jackson Coppell was the, uh, the, the founder of Solidarity. And so back in the days, early days, we would talk, and I said, you know, I'm building a village, so I'm going to need street lights. So, and I remember me and Jackson, we would try to fill out these grants for street lights, and it would just get turned down and turned down until we just decided, you know what, we get ready to do a crowdfunding thing and we were able, and that's how we were able to get the five streetlights with Wi-Fi capabilities. Also, Parker Village is a space in Highland Park too that has like five streetlights uh, clustered over there. It's a smart energy, um, up and coming uh, smart village that Juan Shannon is actually uh, building. So we do a lot of things in partnership and actually we're in partnership with the uh, Communities Leap Project with the Department of Energy uh, that I spoke about earlier. It's Solidarity, Parker Village, and it's Avalon Village. So we're the one main core group that uh, went in with the city of Highland Park to get that application done to forward Highland Park into a more green infrastructure. We got a special opportunity for two more questions. Two more questions. Should I move? Are there other blocks that are in Highland Park? It's pretty small. Are there other blocks that are following suit? Have so you inspired other groups to do the same thing. Yes, yes, I've done. Uh, yes, we have. We've inspired. We got one in here right now. Right here with truth. Yes, that's my brother. They bought property on. Is it Church Street, Church or Chandler, Candler? Candler, yes. Building, he has liberated farms. They have nature spill. So a lot of, and a lot of the brothers and sisters that, and they're, uh, I would say they're younger. You know, we we just like here. Here's what you do. You know, and basically showing them the way to do it. So yeah, it has spread it, and it's little clusters of stuff. So it's not a block, block a whole block, but there is clusters, and you can tell the spread. That's so exciting too to see. We have one more question. All right. I Will have you? one. Okay. Hi. Um, can you share a little bit more about uh, like the services and community resources you have for elders and what role they play in the community? Yes. So we have a, uh, right now what we do is that we have a, the Avalon Village, uh, it's called the Avalon Village Outreach. And so what we do is, is that we have like five senior buildings uh, that we really dedicate a lot of our attention to. And we deliver things uh, like uh, soup, socks. I do something called the soup and sock giveaway, where we go donate uh, socks, soup, 
shea butter, tea, and honey and lemon. We put them in bags, and I have the children actually. That's part of what they do, and they go and they deliver them. We hop in the truck, we go deliver them. So that's one of our things that we go to each senior building and go and do that. We also have uh, the Highland Park Community Crisis Coalition. Um, we're one of the hubs. So anytime a senior is in emergent, it needs an emergency situation, we're able to drive over there. We're able to deliver. We have a hotline to where they can call to be able to get services as well. And we're building on that too. Sorry, I was distracted. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank we you really so appreciate much, your time. Peace and love. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Mama Shu. That was a beautiful, beautiful keynote. I'm sure that there are more questions. So um, I don't know how long you'll be here, Mama Shu. And I know we have um, some breakout sessions next. So if you are not able to find a way to contact Mama Shu in Avalon Village, just check for someone in a purple shirt and they'll help navigate um, to you. And also, there are index cards in the back. So if you didn't get a chance to bring a photo of an ancestor, you can write their name back there um, so that they can be honored as well. And then as a final reminder, the Middle Eastern North African room has been changed to 2629. And again, if you have any questions, look for someone in a purple shirt. And then the final reminder about affinity groups, look for someone in a purple shirt, shirt if you have questions about where you should be going. Um, but there is a definition about affinity groups in the program, so just make sure you're following that accordingly. And enjoy the next two sessions.